This is a response to P.P. Simmons' video, Evo Takes Another Hard Fall, Slammed Again, Tiktaalik Not a Transitionary Fossil. Well, Carl, just when I thought you'd given up on smearing science with the vile filth that's continually being disgorged by that pasty organ that passes for your brain, you've surprised me by puking up two fine new examples of creationist mental manure in short succession. I dealt with your somewhat unconventional ideas regarding the nature of science in Holy Hallucinations 26, but it appears that I was a little too gentle with you on that occasion because you seem to have been able to sit down a lot earlier than I expected to produce this new video, in which you offer us your profound insights into the paleontological significance of Tiktaalik. As luck would have it, Carl, I recently finished reading Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin, the co-discoverer of this particular fossil. This quite stunning coincidence almost had me thinking that it had been deliberately orchestrated by some kind of omniscient and omnipotent yet empirically elusive celestial agency. So if that does happen to be the case, Carl, I can only assume that you've been a naughty, naughty boy, and that the said agency brought about this state of affairs to afford me the opportunity to ram Professor Shubin's book roughly up your ass sideways. So let's get on to the matter in hand and take a look at what you had to say, and while we watch the first clip, Carl, might I suggest you drop your strides, bend over, and get ready to take your divine punishment like a man. According to an intriguing article from Creation Ministries International, tracts of footprints found in a quarry in Poland have turned the evolutionary world upside down. For years, there has been a neat evolutionary story, CMI says, about how fish evolved four legs and came out of the ocean onto the land. The first thing I did after I saw your video, Carl, was something that appears to be anathema to you, and that's a little research. It appears that you've based your latest 3 minute and 49 second offering of digital diarrhea solely on a single article by a gentleman named Taz Wanker, I mean Walker. While superficially it seems that Dr. Wanker's PhD in mechanical engineering doesn't really qualify him as an authority in the areas of paleontology and evolutionary biology, it turns out that he does hold a bachelor's in earth science. This means that Dr. Wanker can't claim ignorance as an excuse and so, having suffered through reading his article, I can only conclude that he's either the dumbest fuck to ever earn a degree, or the biggest liar to emerge from the creationist camp since Kent Hovind pulled out his biro and started filling in his first tax return. In either case, of course, this didn't stop you from wolfing down this festering intellectual turd as if it were the last donut at a cops convention, and then spewing it back up all over YouTube in your own inimitable style. And as for the neat evolutionary story with regard to the origins of tetrapods, I presume that this is the same story that is part of perhaps the most empirically supported theoretical edifice in all of science and the cornerstone of modern biology. You know, the same theory that you and your fellow lying fuckers disparage at every opportunity because it not only demonstrates that your cherished fables are based in imagination and not fact, but also because it interferes with your ability to cling to the notion that humans are somehow better than animals, despite your own behavior doing nothing other than demonstrate that your own place in nature is somewhere between a tapeworm and a pubic louse. So we'll get back to those Polish footprints later, but for now let's get on and see why you and Dr. Wanker have a problem with physical evidence in general and Tiktaalik specifically probably the most famous fossil in this sea-to-land icon of evolution is Tiktaalik rosé, a fish with fins that was claimed to have had features intermediate between fish and tetrapods. Creationists consistently rejected the evolutionary spin put on the fossil and showed that it had nothing to do with the alleged sea-to-land transition. Tiktaalik has been extensively studied by the world's most highly trained and respected paleontologists and anatomists, who have dedicated lifetimes to become leading experts in these fields. These experts have published their results in the world's most prestigious scientific journal and their work has therefore been thoroughly vetted by passing the critical review of their peers. From this we know that Tiktaalik was an animal that was in the process of transitioning from an aquatic to a terrestrial lifestyle because it possessed some of the characteristics of fish, some of tetrapods and some intermediate between the two. On the fish side it had webbed fins, scales and gills, while numerous skeletal features such as the combination of a humerus, tibia and fibula with radiating fish-like digits in the forelimbs, 
The size and placement of the spiracles or ear notches and the dimensions of the higher mandibula in the skull are clearly intermediate between their counterparts in fish and early tetrapods. On the tetrapod side, Tiktaalik had eyes placed atop a flat head, lungs, ribs, an articulating neck, and a pectoral girdle that wasn't attached to its head, features that are never found in fish but are common to most tetrapods. It's interesting then, Carl, that while pointing out that creationists rejected the evolutionary spin put on the fossil, you also claim that this miserable collection of incompetent and dishonest buffoons showed that it had nothing to do with the sea land transition. As far as I'm aware, creationists have done no such thing. As an example, let's take Jonathan Farty, I mean Jonathan Safati's article for Creation Ministries International on the subject of Tiktaalik. It seems he has a PhD in physical chemistry which apparently eminently qualifies him to reject the essentially unanimous opinion of the world's paleontological community, but unfortunately all his article essentially amounts to is a series of outrageously dishonest quote minds and quite stupendously inaccurate representations of the mechanics of evolution and the nature of transitional forms. In this particular digital shitstream, Dr. Farty does nothing to discredit Tiktaalik's mixture of fish and tetrapod characters and instead tries to muddy the waters by working on the simplistic and probably intentionally misleading assumption that the fossil record represents a lineage of direct descent rather than a phylogeny of both closely and distantly related cousins and by discounting the well-established concept of evolutionary stasis. To illustrate a point, let's take a look at how Shubin, Deschler and Jenkins described the articulation of Tiktaalik's humerus in their landmark Nature paper. The simultaneous apposition of the reversed concavo-convex geometries of the anterior and posterior parts of the articulation represents a close-packed, almost stable joint position. Additionally, stability would be contributed through the action of the transcoracoid musculature. Now, let's compare this with what Dr. Farty had to say about that particular part of the anatomy. Indeed, Tiktaalik's fin was not connected to the main skeleton so could not have supported its weight on land. The discoverers claimed that this could have helped to prop up the body as the fish moved along a water bottom, but evolutionists had similar high hopes for the coelacanth fin. Notice the complete lack of technically descriptive detail, the failure to even attempt to provide an argument to support the bold assertion, and the substitution of said argument with a pathetically transparent guilt-by-association logical fallacy. Anyone with any kind of background in science will immediately recognize Farty's language as that of either a rank amateur or sophist that could only be convincing to someone who's either been extensively indoctrinated or is recovering from a particularly nasty cerebral embolism. You know, Carl, someone like you. So while this might count as showing to you, to anyone with an ability to sustain an even vaguely coherent thought process, in reality it's merely reminiscent of a retard standing up and either proclaiming No, it's not! to every statement of fact or settling for shouting nothing but It's a fish! in lieu of argumentation, while fully expecting to be taken seriously. Rejecting something outright without specifying precisely why Carl doesn't constitute an argument because it's so easy that any subnormal fuckwit can do it. For example, if I wanted to, I could quite happily make myself look like a complete tit by claiming that Barack Obama is not a US citizen whilst providing not one shred of evidence or even a cogent argument to support it. Of course, that wouldn't mean I was right, just that I was a complete and utter twat and quite possibly the dumbest fuck on the planet. Richard Dawkins, in his latest book, The Greatest Show on Earth, claims Tiktaalik is the perfect missing link. Perfect because it almost exactly splits the difference between fish and amphibian, and perfect because it is missing no longer, Dawkins says. But now this footprint evidence from Poland consigns Tiktaalik and all its companion fossils onto the garbage heap. Unfortunately, despite your most fervent desires, Carl, as we'll see later, the footprint evidence does nothing of the kind. I'm afraid that your ambitious claims about the fate of Tiktaalik and other alpistostegid fossils is about as accurate as the Vatican's pronouncements on viral epidemiology. It is unfortunate that Dawkins used the outdated layman's term missing link because it leaves the impression that paleontologists claim that transitional fossils are de facto direct ancestors of either other fossilized life forms or of extant species. It's exactly this fallacious misconception that pompous asshats like Jonathan Farty 
and the collection of other CMI numbnuts he cites in his so-called article used as the basis for their ludicrously simple-minded arguments. In reality, paleontologists take pains to point out that such fossils are much more likely to have been cousins, side shoots and the tree of life, but nevertheless most likely reasonable representations of the actual common ancestors of the major evolutionary lineages. That's because the only way to be 100% certain of any given phylogeny is to watch and track every single birth along the lineage, and while this might be the only kind of evidence that the most delusional of creationists would accept, and even then quite frankly I'm not convinced they would, anyone even vaguely in tune with the concept of reality will realize that that's not going to happen. So despite what you say, Carl, Tiktaalik remains a transitional fossil because it was never purported to be the basal ancestor of the tetrapod lineage, but because it bears a distinct mosaic of characters of both fish and tetrapods as well as several intermediate features, and as a result represents a reasonable approximation of that ancestor. This very fact is wonderfully illustrated by the following passage from Neil Shubin's book Your Inner Fish where he describes what happened when he took a cast of Tiktaalik to his son's kindergarten class and asked them what they thought it was. Hand shot up. The first kid said it was a crocodile or an alligator. When queried why, he said that like a crocodile or lizard, it had a flat head with eyes on top. Big teeth, too. Other children started to voice their dissent. Choosing the raised hand from one of the kids, I heard, No, no, it isn't a crocodile, it is a fish, because it has scales and fins. Yet another child shouted, Maybe it is both. Tiktaalik's message is so straightforward, even preschoolers can see it. And that's exactly the point, Carl. The significance of Tiktaalik is blindingly obvious to even a five-year-old, and yet escapes the attention of grown men and women suffering from that tragic case of profound mental retardation known as creationism. I fervently hope that one day both you and the poor people whose minds you're poisoning with your delusions will just grow up. Creation International claims that it has now been demonstrated in a strong case that these supposed evolutionary links were in reality four-legged animals that resembled large lizards. I was in two minds as to whether to include this clip because the point I wanted to make might seem a little trivial. In the end, I decided to use it though, Carl, because it's a wonderful demonstration of exactly how big a bunch of dim-witted bell-ends Taz-wanker you and your sniveling toadies at the P.P. Simmons channel truly are. And that's because the original Nature paper, which you quite evidently didn't bother to read before you opened up the spigot of this particular sewer, doesn't mention reptiles at all and in fact uses a generic representation of the early amphibian tetrapods Ichthyostega and Acanthostega. In case you didn't know what the rest of us learnt in third grade, Carl, lizards are reptiles, not amphibians, which may not matter much to you, but I can assure you matters considerably to the animals concerned, which is why it is exceedingly rare to come across a frog trying to fuck an alligator. As I said, this is somewhat of a minor point, but I decided to bring it up to illustrate not only your, but also Taz Walker's complete disregard for anything even vaguely approaching academic rigor, and your complete disdain for those pesky inconveniences that the rest of us refer to as facts. If four-legged animals existed 18 million years earlier, then Tiktaalik can't be the transitional fossil it has been claimed to be. Tiktaalik has suddenly been demoted to an evolutionary dead end, along with all the other fossils connected with it. In other words, all those neat evolutionary diagrams that vividly displayed the transition from fish to four-footed animal ancestor now need to be disposed of. So now we're getting down to the heart of the matter, so let's get this over with. Firstly, despite your deluded and uninformed assertions, Tiktaalik is very much still a transitional fossil for the reasons I gave earlier. However, if, as I strongly suspect, what you are trying to say is that Tiktaalik cannot be the direct common ancestor of extant tetrapods, then surprisingly you'd be right. But since no credible paleontologist or evolutionary biologist has ever claimed it was, then your point is somewhat moot, isn't it? At the risk of repeating myself, these species have never been purported to be our direct ancestors, but rather representative cousins of those ancestors. Using the diagram you yourself showed, anyone who cares to can clearly see that all of these species are not placed in a line of direct descent, 
but rather as offshoots of it. You see, Carl, your doltish ignorance of evolutionary theory and the inability of your woefully crippled mind to understand or read a cladogram doesn't magically lend credence to your assertions. It simply provides the rest of us with yet more opportunities to laugh at you. The reason this matters is because due to the documented phenomenon of evolutionary stasis, these alpistostegids were more than capable of living contemporaneously with tetrapods because both could have evolved earlier from common alpistostegid stock. Tiktaalik therefore represents a lineage that remained morphologically relatively stable while the tetrapod lineage continued to evolve to exploit the free ecological niches being offered by land. This is exactly why there are still coelacanths and lungfish alive today alongside all the tetrapods that descended from their common Sarcopterygian ancestor. It's because we didn't evolve from coelacanths, Carl. We evolved from a coelacanth-like species that lived and died over 400 million years ago. As a result, the effect of this discovery on the previous phylogeny isn't quite as dramatic as you and your mate Taz would like to make it out to be, and was in fact quite succinctly summarized by Niedzwiecki and colleagues in the final figure of their paper. In fact, I found it fascinating that Dr. Wanker didn't include this figure in his article. I wonder, Carl, do you think it was because he was so ignorant on the subject on which he judged himself qualified to pontificate that he didn't realize its significance? Or was it because he knew full well that if he showed it, it might tip off the people he was so enthusiastically lying to exactly how full of shit he is? Whether Taz was being deliberately deceitful or merely retarded is neither here nor there, though, because in either case the net effect was that he didn't present the diagram that would have shown exactly how much hot air had gone into overinflating the effect of this discovery on evolutionary theory. You see, Carl, while it certainly does lead to a reassessment of the timing and environment of the water-to-land transition, all that has happened is that the original phylogeny has been stretched back 18 million years to accommodate the new find, creating a slew of so-called ghost lineages where both tetrapods and alpistostegids must have coexisted but have not yet been discovered in the fossil record. Imperfections in this record are nothing new and have long been recognized and well documented. For example, Roma's gap originally ran from 360 to 345 million years ago, a critical period in early tetrapod evolution, and while recent discoveries have closed it somewhat, it still remains a poor source of information for this period of life's history. There's a gap of some 60 million years in the record of pachycephalosaurs, which are present both before and after it, while the coelacanth, which is still with us, hasn't been found in the fossil record since the Cretaceous, representing a ghost range of some 80 million years. And while 18 million years may seem like a long time, try considering it in comparison to the 3.8 billion years since life first arose or the 660 million years since the appearance of multicellularity. The big deal you're trying to make here, Carl, amounts to an adjustment of one half to less than 3%. So while the discovery is scientifically a highly significant contribution to our understanding of tetrapod evolution, it's hardly the silver bullet that you and your fellow fuckwits have been dreaming of finding to take out the werewolf that's been pounding your beliefs up the arse for the past 150 years. Something of the magnitude of the upset can be gleaned from statements made about the find in Nature magazine. Quote, this forces a radical reassessment of the timing, ecology, and environmental setting of the fish tetrapod transition as well as the completeness of the body fossil record. And this quote, it will cause a significant reappraisal of our understanding of tetrapod origins. You may not have noticed this, Carl, but neither of these statements or the other tactical quote minds in Taz Wanker's article say anything to the effect of, this discovery seriously undermines the entire basis of evolutionary theory and thus forces us to consider alternative hypotheses with regards to the generation of biological diversity, particularly those concocted millennia ago by ignorant, bloodthirsty desert goat fuckers. All of these quotes exemplify the nature of science and the scientific method, which is obliged to consider all new data and modify its explanations to reflect the collected evidence as accurately as possible. Of course this new evidence will result in the reformulation of current phylogenies, a reassessment of the timing of the colonization of land, and because the tracks were discovered in what used to be a marine environment, a revision of the hypothesis that the transition might have occurred in rivers. 
Now let's contrast this self-correcting and intellectually honest approach to discovering the truth with your particular religious mindset, shall we, Carl? You know, the mindset that'll never allow you to admit you're wrong no matter how much evidence is rammed unceremoniously up your tailpipe, nor how hard you have to fly in the face of patently demonstratable reality. The mindset that means that even if Lord Vishnu himself were to materialize before both you and your pal Taz, cut off your dangly bits and shove them up each other's body cavities, you'd still insist that yours was the only true religion and that Hindus were the ones who were being delusional. How well do you think that mindset would have served us in this ever-changing world if everyone had chosen to adopt it, Carl? Could it be that we'd still be sitting around our darkened hovels, dining on roast witch, debating how many feathers are on an angel's wing, and discussing who was going to be the next guest on the Torture the Heretic show? All in all, I'm glad that ignorant fuckers like you didn't get your way and grateful to those in the past who chose discovery and enlightenment over dogma and superstition. You see, Carl, the kinds of statements you and Taz quoted are indicative of the strength of science, and not some kind of fatal weakness that you seem to think you're dramatically exposing. Of course, you at least have some excuse for peddling this particular line of nonsensical bullshit because you are, after all, an ignorant asshat who doesn't know the difference between his pyloric and his highly dilated anal sphincter. Dr. Wanker, on the other hand, has at least allegedly a scientific background, and so for him to use these perfectly legitimate statements to sleazily smear genuine science with his putrid misrepresentations proves just one thing, and that's exactly how big a lying shitbag he is. But then again, he is a creationist, so unlike the Polish trackways, that shouldn't come as much of a surprise. Those scientists who have dedicated their lives and careers to the standard fish-to-be story will not be very enthused by the implications of the latest find. They will be reluctant to change, especially since they have nothing to replace it with, CMI says. Jesus fucking H Christ, Carl. The thing that amazes me about your videos is that just when one thinks you've plunged to the very limits of human mental retardation, you somehow manage to find a way to push the envelope just a little further. In this case, you and Taz have managed to reach the intellectual level of an amoeba, and not a particularly bright one at that. In response to this particular festering turd, I'd simply ask one question. Who the fuck exactly do you think discovered these tracks and published them in one of the world's most respected journals? I think you'll find it was none other than those scientists who've dedicated their lives and careers to the standard fish-to-beast story. Does this really seem like the action of people who'd be so crushed by the implications of this new evidence? If they were really that concerned, Carl, wouldn't it have made more sense to suppress it? After all, that's an accusation that many of your fellow fucktards make on a regular basis, and which you and Taz have done a fine job of demonstrating is simply yet another pile of steaming creationist crap. I myself can't imagine the magnitude of the neural dysfunction that would allow any human being to make this kind of patently ludicrous pronouncement and do it in all seriousness. This assertion, or more to the point, the fact that neither you or Taz seem to realize how utterly and unambiguously self-poning it is, really does highlight the toxic nature of your particular flavor of belief, Carl, because its poison cripples minds to the point where reality and fantasy, sanity and psychosis and truth and delusion become indistinguishable. For your information, you sad and pathetic little man, surprises such as these are the lifeblood of working scientists. They provide new challenges, new opportunities for discovery and new questions to be asked and answered. In this particular case, a new span of 18 million years and a new environmental milieu to explore, I'm sure has paleontologists everywhere champing at the bit to get into the field and uncover what I'm sure are going to be some particularly spectacular new fossil finds. That's because unlike you, Carl, these people aren't happy to settle for the warmth of the comfort blanket provided by the certainty of dogmatic beliefs whose accuracy isn't important, but instead are driven with the desire to explore the vistas of the unknown, to uncover the truth about nature, and by the thrill of discovery. And I personally thank my lucky stars for people like them, Carl, 
because if in the past it had been entirely up to people like you, we wouldn't be discovering the magnificence of this breathtaking universe and the intricacy of the wonders of life. Instead, we'd be eking out a miserable existence and explaining everything with primitive fables and magic.